Good morning, and thank you for joining us. My name is Susan Phillip. I'm the health officer for the city and county of San Francisco. And um, we're here this morning as Bay Area health officers representing the counties of San Francisco, Alameda, Contra Costa, Marin, San Benito, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, Sonoma, and the city of Berkeley. You will see that we are not wearing our masks and we are not distancing. This is in, in accordance with both California and the San Francisco Department of Health health orders as we are all vaccinated and we are outdoors. We are here united in our support of opening California schools for full-time in-person instruction for all grades when the school year begins this fall. The lack of in-person learning has disrupted education, weakened the social supports provided by school communities, negatively impacted mental health, and prevented participation in the rituals and shared milestones that tie our communities together. This morning, you will hear from health officers from throughout the Bay Area about the urgent need to return to in-school uh, person, in-person in school, and about the data, science, and facts that have united us in our guidance that students can safely return to school. Our next speaker is Dr. Scott Morrow, the San Mateo Health Officer. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. I'm Dr. Scott Morrow, I'm the San Mateo County Health Officer, and if you've read my statements over the last year, you have a very clear idea about my thinking, um, particularly my, very, my high premium on balance and the balance in decision making. We were all faced with lots of dilemmas last year. My colleagues and I had lots of dilemmas, innumerable dilemmas, unimaginable dilemmas. We had to make decisions that affected millions. And we used, um, and the, the decisions that we made were, the choices that we had before us were very difficult. We had, the choices we had were between a bad decision, a worse decision, and a far worse decision. What we tried to use to the best of our ability is cost-benefit analysis to make these decisions. Um, and sometimes it was not terribly clear, the cost and benefits. It was hard to ascertain those. But there is one cost benefit analysis that is crystal clear. The cost to our kids by keeping them out of school and remote learning is immense and far outweighs any benefit. The cost to our kids includes cost to their social development, their emotional well-being, their long-term mental health, and these impacts are going to last for a long, long time for many of them. The data is very clear. We're seeing significant rise and increase in all sorts of issues, anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicidality, alcohol and drug use, and a host of other chronic medical, uh, mental health conditions. The data is clear. Kids must return to school. School must begin full time, in person, full classrooms this fall, if not sooner. The data is also clear. This can be done safely, which you'll hear about shortly. There is no other viable option. School must com completely go back to normal in the fall. I'm now gonna turn it over to Dr. Sarah Cody, who's the health officer for Santa Clara County. Thank you, Dr. Morrow, and uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Sarah Cody. I'm the health officer for Santa Clara County. And uh, we are here today uh, to urge, urge every school at every level to open their classrooms for full in-person learning for all students. And on this, um, us Bay Area health officers uh, stand together. This is our first in-person reunion since our shelter-in-place order in March 16th. As you know, we have charted 
slightly different paths over the course of the pandemic. It's been enormously difficult. On this, we are 100% united. I want to express my gratitude, not just to my fellow health officers, but to the education community, all of the county superintendents, the superintendents of each school district, um, the teachers, the staff, the students, and the families. We have all worked very hard over the last year to ensure the safety of all. The safety of our education community has been our um, top concern during this pandemic, and we have learned a lot as we have progressed through the pandemic. We've adjusted our guidance as necessary when we've learned more about the science of COVID, how it spread, and how it impacts schools and our communities, and we have pivoted as necessary. And this is why at this moment in time, we feel that it is urgent for schools uh, to be open to all. So I just want to um, close after the um, Muni passes. <laughs> Again, with my, my gratitude to the entire school community and to all of the leaders in every school who have worked in partnership uh, with all of us uh, over this pandemic. And of course, to my fellow health officers. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Matt Willis, the health officer for Marin County. Thank you, Dr. Cody. I'm Matt Willis, public health officer for Marin. Good morning. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Cody and my fe fellow health officers for, for the collaboration and the leadership that you've shown over the past year plus. As Dr. Morrow indicated, a lot of the decisions we made were not clear cut. Um, and one that is clear to all of us, especially now where we sit with a year under our belts of experiencing schools, is that we can and must reopen schools fully to in-person in learning. And while this is a, a national priority, we in the Bay Area are in an especially good position to see all students back in classrooms safely. First, we've seen firsthand that the rate of transmission within schools is low. In Marin, for example, with now nearly 3 million accumulated student days across 110 open schools, we've seen no occasions where a student infected an adult in school and found that children are far more likely to be infected outside of school in the general community than within the school. Second, the Bay Area has high vaccination rates. In an analysis published in mid-May, seven of the 15 most highly vaccinated counties in the United States are Bay Area counties. The state and region also has correspondingly low and declining COVID-19 case rates. These factors taken together, low baseline risk of in-school infection, the new protection of highly effective vaccines on a backdrop of low community transmission combine to support our unequivocal support and public health recommendation for full reopening. I'd like to introduce Dr. Gail Newell, Public Health Officer for Santa Cruz County. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here with my colleagues, fellow health officers from throughout the Bay Area. As the others have noted, returning to school in person, in the classroom, full-time in the fall is imperative. Public health researchers, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the California Department of Public Health, and local health departments have learned from the research and the experiences of classroom instruction from the fall of 2020 through the winter and spring of 2021. The science is now clear that the risk of transmission among children wearing masks is very low even with reduced spacing between desks. You'll find in your press release a link, a hyperlink that you can refer to for a CDC science brief on transmission of COVID in K through 12 schools. There are 72 scientific articles, research, in which to base our recommendations today. The conclusions of that scientific brief 
stress that reducing transmission in schools is a shared responsibility. I'd like to thank our educators and our education community for everything they've done to work alongside us for this shared responsibility, as well as students and parents and the families of our communities. It's clear that a combination of effective prevention strategies will be the answer to safe reopening of our schools, our classrooms full time. The use of masks, physical distancing, hand washing and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and maintaining health facilities, contact tracing along with isolation and quarantine will limit transmission in the school settings. And vaccinations are key. They are so important and will keep our teachers and our older students safe as they return to the classroom. At this point, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Chris Farnitano, Health Officer from Contra Costa County. Thank you, Dr. Newell. I would also like to thank all my fellow uh, health officers across the Bay Area for all their tireless work over the past year to help keep our community safe. This pandemic has disrupt, disrupted much in our lives and, and in our children's lives, um, much more than just our children's education. Because schools are not just places for academic learning, they are important for children's social development as well. School is where kids go to meet new friends. It is where they go to play with other kids. School is where they go to learn about life and develop social skills. These skills are learned in class and out of class, in the lunchroom and in band, in sports teams, and in after school clubs. Schools are an, also an important part of the social safety net for our young families. For many children, schools provide them with the most reliable source of healthy food through the school lunch and school breakfast programs. While those programs continued during our year of remote learning, it was harder for students to ac access the meals if they were not already on campus for class. For students who live in troubled homes, going to school offers kids structure and refuge from what may be a chaotic home life. A teacher, coach, or classmate may be the first person to notice a child or teen struggling with mental health issues and help connect them to a school counselor. In addition to not seeing the inside of a classroom for much of the past year, our kids have also missed out on many cherished rituals and milestones during the past year plus of the pandemic. Unfortunately, most students in the Bay Area have been unable to experience traditional graduation celebrations with their friends during the pandemic. Events like homecoming, senior prom, school dances, and grad night have been missed or greatly scaled back. These are important events and memories that last a lifetime. These shared rites and passages uh, and milestones are vital to the mental health and well-being of our children as they grow up. School is much more than a classroom. I want to turn back to uh, Dr. Phillip. Thank you, Dr. Farnitano. So from our statements today, from our press statement, from our presence here together, I think you can all see how immense a priority this is for all of us who are responsible for the health of all residents in the Bay Area. It's time to move past the remote learning model and back to the full range of learning and support that our educational communities provide. Bay Area health officers urge school administrators, teachers, and parents to work together now to plan for full classrooms for all grades in the fall. And with that, we will uh, open for question and answers. If there are particular health officers that you would like to respond, please, uh, please include that at the beginning of your question. Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. Stephanie Sierra with ABC7. This question is for every health officer. First, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to start with uh, Dr. Cody, if I can. Uh, but the question applies to everyone. Once school resumes, will students and teachers be required to wear masks inside the classroom? If not, what situations will masks be required? 
uh, in Santa Clara County, and I believe in most, uh, in all of the Bay Area uh, health jurisdictions, we will be following the, the guidance, the school guidance from the California uh, Department of Public Health. Um, I would invite any of my colleagues uh, if they have any refinements on that. But I think that we are, uh, through the pandemic, we have been working with our partners uh, at the state and adapting. They've been adapting according to CDC guidance, and that's the guidance that, we're, that we will uh, be following. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to? Hi, uh, Kathy Novak from KCBS Radio. Again, for everyone, but perhaps I might start with Dr. Phillip. Here in San Francisco, one of the barriers to widening the reopening seemed to be staffing and the fact that hundreds of staff were applying for exemptions if they were at high risk or lived with someone at high risk. I wonder if you have a message to the staff who are still concerned about going back to work. Well, I think our, our message is, is, is for everyone, for families, for staff, for anyone who is concerned about COVID-19. As Dr. Willis has said, the vaccines have been uh, the key, the, the, the change agent in allowing us to talk differently, to think differently, to have different and more open policies here in San Francisco, the Bay Area, and nationwide. And um, so what I would say is that uh, people should get their COVID-19 vaccine if they have not. Increasing amounts of data over time and over, uh, over many millions of people who've gotten these vaccines show how extraordinarily effective they are at preventing infections and preventing severe disease and death. So uh, taking advantage of the opportunities to get vaccine is the number one thing that teachers and families can do to protect themselves and quite frankly, to protect students. Our data show that students who have become infected have done so because there have been unvaccinated adults within their household, not from being at school. Uh, I'm Solomon Moore with Bay Area News Group and Mercury News. Uh, I wanted to know from any any of you uh, if there's any serious active proposal to extend uh, distance learning proposal uh, in Sacramento. Uh, also, if uh, schools do reopen and there are outbreaks and distance learning authority has been uh, ended, uh, what kind of plans do you have to deal with such a situation? I'll call on you if you make me. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. Um, we work really closely with state officials, and what we are hearing from state officials is they are very committed to full in-person learning as well. So we, we are working closely with them, and, and we see the, the state uh, health officials are also working very hard to, to get all of our students back to school in the fall. We, we have plans um, and we have exercised those plans uh, to deal with outbreaks in schools and we'll continue to have those plans. We, we do expect there will be cases at schools, um, especially uh, until we have a vaccine that's available for younger students. Um, but we know from experience that even when there are uh, cases at schools, transmission in the classroom is very, very rare. So we have plans uh, to identify cases, do contact tracing as we've always done, uh, and try to minimize the risk in, in classrooms. But we know that classrooms, even when we've reduced the spacing between desks uh, to six feet, then four feet, then three feet and less, that the classroom environment is a very safe environment and it's getting more and more safe as more of our older students and staff are vaccinated. I just wanted to follow up though on the first question, which wasn't about support for um, reopening of schools, but rather, is there support to extend extended uh, to extend distance learning uh, authority? There, some schools may have um, been developing options for distance learning. Um, we still want to have the option for in-person learning available for every family who who wants to bring their children back full time. Hi, Jill Tucker from the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, I'm wondering if, if somebody, maybe Matt, or, or somebody could um, address more specifically what you uh, would like to see the, uh, the school day, the school week, the school year look like. Um, you know, do you envision dances and football games and crowded gymnasiums and band practice and, and uh, PE 
you know, in, in, in the gym. I, you know, I'm wondering if you could just sort of specify what that would look like and what would be acceptable. Um, and then also specifically, if, if you believe any social distancing will still be required, any quarantining, um, and, and under what scenarios um, that might, might be, or ventilation recommendations, what, what types of recommendations do you still envision having in the fall when, when we are fully, fully reopened as a state? Thank you for that question. We're, uh, in our goal, as we've said, is full reopening, full time, um, to classroom-based learning. Um, there will be, especially in, you know, for, it will be different for middle and high schools where our 12-year-olds and above now can be vaccinated and all the staff in those settings can also be vaccinated. So the mental image is a really well-protected environment where both the students and the staff have that benefit of a 95% effective vaccine. The other additional benefit that Dr. Farnatano mentioned is that in those settings when transmission might occur, the risk, the, the consequences of infection are much, are much less, right? So you're much less likely to come to the hospital, much less likely to have severe illness or pass. And that's an important piece of context um, to protect both those that, you know, we, who may be not able to be vaccinated or those who are more medically vulnerable even after they've been vaccinated. For younger elementary school settings, where until we're able to, you know, we're eager obviously for the emergency youth authorization for children uh, all the way up to age 11. I think we're, gonna, we're looking at likely starting the school year before that happens. So we're looking at environments where facial covering, as much as you know, a reasonable social distancing as, as practicable within that setting will be important for elementary students. Um, but again, because the adults in that environment have the benefit of vaccination, the consequences and the, and the risks are much lower. And then from there, it really is, you know, I think it's similar to the way we're approaching the post-June 15th world, which is understanding ourselves the principles of safety and applying them situationally in a variety of different settings rather than have a set specific set of regulations that, it, that deals with every possible contingency. It's really up to leadership at the school level with the guidance of public health to determine what the risk is in that particular setting, understanding the, the way transmission occurs. The question is, will, will it be recommended if there's a, a two-week quarantine? If, if someone tests, it, it depends on the nature of the exposure. Any other follow-up question? Um, just another question uh, about how you are verifying vaccinations, and, and what if th there's families who choose not to vaccinate their children, how do you approach that situation? Will they be able to still come to class or how will that be addressed? And Matt, Dr. Cody? Uh, to my knowledge, and, and I invite any of my colleagues to, to speak if they understand differently, um, there's certainly no uh, statewide system uh, regarding vaccination of students. Um, uh, schools such as many universities have put into place policies where they do require vaccination and check vaccination status. Um, and, and of course, uh, Cal OSHA regulates the work environment. So employees and staff at a school, uh, the, the school would need to know their vaccination status, but there's nothing um, across the board uh, regarding students. I do wanna just emphasize what my colleagues have said, which is uh, how safe and effective the vaccines are um, and how they have completely changed our ability to do so many things and how important they are. And given that they can now, you know, anyone age 12 and up can become vaccinated and protected, uh, that really opens the doors wide open uh, for so many things, including in-person school. Thanks. So just to clarify though, so you're saying it's up to the, the individual school district to, to make that determination about verifying vaccinations? Or? So um, uh, the, the uh, Cal OSHA uh, governs and regulates the employer setting. So a school district, there are, they are employers, uh, and so that governs the staff of that district. It doesn't, however, govern the students and the families. Um, so there isn't anything, there's no system in place that requires that a school know the vaccination status of the students. However, 
if there's, for example, um, an outbreak or a concern about transmission in a school, then the outbreak investigation, of course, would uh, we would need to know who was not protected from the vaccine uh, and exposed because those would be uh, people that would need to quarantine uh, for the regular quarantine period. Thanks. One more question, if there's one. Well, thank you. And uh, if you have not checked, a member of the media had not checked in with me, I'm Noel, I would like to get your name in case there's follow-up materials. Um, we are gonna have the um, health officers uh, group for a photo, so it's a group opportunity if you wanted to take a photo or video. Thank you.